Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. The call of God to the ministry of word and sacrament can be kind of tricky. In my case, I knew at age eight that God wanted me to go into the ministry, and for the next four or five years, everyone around me was sure, and I myself was sure that I was going to be a priest. I grew up Roman Catholic. Well, then puberty came, <laughs> and suddenly this whole church thing made less and less sense, and being a celibate priest became less and less you know, good. <laughs> and I started to drift away more and more as I became older, although not necessarily wiser. Then life happened. And even though ever since I came to this country at age 21, I've been working for the church in one capacity or another, this whole pastor thing kind of got away from me too. So it wasn't until I was in my mid-40s that I finally heard that call again, that, that call that had been there all along, but that had gotten quieter and quieter over the years, drowned out by life's other priorities. Just like me, Karen, I know that your road to ordination and service as a minister of word and sacrament has been kind of well, shall we say circuitous? And in your case, it was later in life when seminary beckoned. The thing that counts, though, today on the day of your ordination especially, is that you answered the call. And I want to tell you, Karen, that you've always answered God's call, not just when you finally ended up in seminary, but actually all of your life. You see, it's a fallacy to say that God only calls us to word and sacrament ministry or that God only calls pastors and deacons and bishops. God calls us all to ministry, ministry of all kinds, in many other ways, too. And in your case, Karen, you followed God's call through a life as an educator, dedicated to making a difference and spreading God's word by teaching and caring for generations of God's children. You followed God's call by becoming a wife, by being a mother, now a grandmother. You followed God's call by joining a marvelous congregation, Good Shepherd in Goldsboro, that shaped you and cared for you even as you shaped and cared for others. As a Sunday school teacher, as an assisting minister, to name only two of the offices that you held in that congregation. You followed God's call that began for you when you were baptized, when your parents and your sponsors made promises on your behalf. And again at your confirmation, when you repeated those same promises for yourself. Promises to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people, following the example of Jesus, to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. See, these baptismal promises are mirrored in the ordination vows that you are about to take today, Karen. As a pastor in God's holy church, you are to lead God's faithful people, preach and teach according to the holy scriptures, pray for God's people and nourish them with the word and the holy sacraments, lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living, give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all, in all that you do. From your baptismal promises then, to your ordination vows now, well, in a sense, Karen, you have come full circle. And in the process, you have followed God's call faithfully and, I dare say, with passion, integrity, and even grit. Which, by the way, 
are the kind of things that pastors need, passion, integrity, and grit. And maybe a good measure of visionary leadership thrown in, you know the kind that is actually convinced that it can change the world? Passion, integrity, grit, that's what Jesus was looking for in those first disciples. He didn't always get it, mind you, but he sure wanted them to have it. See, in this story, in this gospel reading from Mark, Jesus begins his ministry and starts picking his first disciples. He's putting together his executive team, so to speak. John the baptizer has just been arrested. King Herod took him out of circulation. So it's time for Jesus to come into his own and to begin his public ministry. Now, Simon and Andrew and James and John, well, they were quite ordinary people, folks just like you, Karen, and like me and like everybody else here. We actually don't know a whole lot about them. We know that Simon and Andrew apparently owned a house. I've seen the ruins when I was visiting Capernaum. And that James and John presumably were good at what they did. They were successful fishers and business people, and they had others working for them. Mark says they had hired men. In our lesson, Jesus calls them to leave all that behind, to leave their lives behind and to follow him. Well, and here comes the big surprise. They actually follow. <laughs> they actually run right off and follow Jesus and leave their lives behind. Would you have done that? Would you have abandoned your old life and left your family behind? Would you have walked off your job and, and, and left the computer running while you bolted from the office? I think not. But Simon and his brother and the sons of Zebedee, they leave their lives behind. They walk off the job. They abandon their families and their businesses. And in James and John's case, they even leave their dad sitting in the boat looking dumbfounded. What just happens is what he must have been thinking. I'm guessing, Karen, that in some way you can kind of appreciate how they all felt by this sudden turn of events. You too recently had to uproot yourself, close down the home that you'd known for decades, move to a new town, as pleasant as that town is, I met some of those people today, and a new home. And I hear there's a 16 foot moving part somewhere between here and there that has half of your life on it and hopefully will make it to your new residence in a couple of weeks, knock on wood. Well, at least you had the presence of mind to take Mick along. He blessedly didn't end up sitting in an abandoned boat looking dumbfounded like good old Zebedee did. But Mark's story illustrates, I think, how life-changing God's call can be, especially when this call involves seminary, the call process, and a new pastorate. Mark says that Simon and his brother Andrew left their boats immediately, and that after that, he immediately called James and John, too. Immediately, you should know, is Mark's favorite word. His is a fast-moving story that doesn't have any time for embellishment or fancy narrative detours. Note that in our reading today, we are only halfway through chapter 1. And we've already heard the story of John the baptizer. We have witnessed Jesus' baptism. We have found Jesus driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And now we are seeing Jesus beginning his public ministry and all that in the first half of the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. For Mark, everything happens immediately. Now, you know as well as I do, dear Karen, that there's nothing immediate in your call as a pastor, or in mine, for that matter. For both of us, this call was a lifetime in coming. 
But as we have already seen, that doesn't mean that we weren't called by God before this. See, for the longest time in the church's history, for many centuries, people thought that this story was about pastors and church workers and missionaries. And it is that too. It is about Jesus calling people to become pastors and deacons and bishops and so on, leaders in Christ's church, whose job it would be to fish for people and bring new people into the church. And for the longest time, it was thought that the clergy had a special kind of calling from God, that pastors and deacons and monks were somehow elevated above all others. They lived in monasteries and convents. They followed special rules. They were treated differently. Ordination, holy orders, was considered a sacrament. Still is in much of Christianity. Well, let me tell you. Along comes Martin Luther in the 16th century. And Luther famously said that as much as a pastor was called to his or her ministry, so even a milkmaid doing her work was also living out her call from God. A milkmaid. Yes, a milkmaid. Luther calls this vocatio, a Latin word that simply means calling. We get our English word vocation from it, which is also a way to kind of describe what we do in life and how we have been called to do what we do. Right? You with me? You with me? Amen. All right. Vocation is a kind of an old-fashioned word, don't you think? We, we don't use that very often. But it's, the, it's the, the word that describes the call we have in life, the career or the job that we hold. But there are many vocations outside of the workplace and outside of the church, too. There is the vocation to be a parent, for example, or to be a son or a daughter or a caregiver for a family member or a grandparent or a neighbor to those who live in our community. We all have various kinds of calling all at the same time. Here's a good example of what vocation means in daily life. When Luther talked about the Lord's Prayer and the petition, give us today our daily bread, he said that God hears our petition and grants our plea, giving us bread through the work of many people. Hmm. So think about the piece of toast you had this morning. You're looking a little puzzled, but it'll make, it'll make sense in a minute, I promise. Think about the piece of toast that you had this morning for breakfast. That piece of toast came from a loaf of bread that you bought at the supermarket or at the corner store. How did it get to the store? Well, a delivery truck brought it and delivered it to the store manager who told the assistant food manager to restock the shelves and to put that loaf of bread there for you to buy. Where did the truck driver get that loaf of bread? Well, the truck driver picked it up at a distribution center from which workers shipped food items they had received from the bakery. And workers in the bakery had made that loaf of bread using flour that had been milled from grain planted and harvested by farmers. And the bakery, in making this bread, also used the milk. Well, here it comes, which the milkmaid had gotten from the cow. Ah, we finally got to the milkmaid. So here's a picture of a somewhat unusual looking milkmaid, uh, milkman, <laughs> milk person. But milking a cow is fun <laughs> and a challenge, let me tell you from my own personal experience. And all of these people, from the grocery store workers to the truck driver to the bakers to the farmers to the milkmen, all of those people were following their callings from God. They were following their vocations. And I haven't even told you yet about that toaster and all the people who were involved in making that toaster and how it got into your kitchen so you could toast that piece of bread this morning. All of this, so that in the end, God could grant our petition, give us this day 
our daily bread. Luther said that each vocation evident in this chain of events is a calling from God and that the calling of the milkmaid is every bit as valuable and as holy as the calling of a pastor. Amen, Amen to that. Actually, Luther went a lot further when he said that even changing a smelly diaper is an act of love and part of a parent's vocation. Here's the quote, wait, wait till you hear it. Luther says, when a father goes ahead and washes diapers and performs some other menial task for his child, and someone ridicules him as an effeminate fool, God with all his angels and creatures is smiling. Don't you just love how he challenges gender stereotypes here? And in the 16th century, no less, has the father changed the diaper? This is what Luther calls the priesthood of all believers. The idea that we are all priests participating in God's holy work through our daily vocations. That makes sense to you? You still with me? Yes. Somebody's got a nod, so I know you're still awake out there. <laughs> See, in this light, when we think about our Christian vocations, the call of Jesus to Andrew and Simon, to Peter and to John, it gets a whole new perspective to it. Because you see, unlike those four apostles, God does not want us to drop everything we are doing and run off to seminary to all become priests and pastors. No, God wants us to live at our vocatio, our everyday calling, whatever that may be, as a secretary or a banker, as an auto mechanic or a lawyer, as a parent or a grandparent or a high school student, and yes, as a pastor too as we see in Karen's case this afternoon. We do God's will and follow Jesus' command if we strive to live out our daily vocation in Christian love of our neighbor. Luther said it this way. We conclude, therefore, that Christians live not in, in themselves but in Christ and the neighbor. They live in Christ through faith and in the neighbor through love. You and I are called to live out our vocations right where God has planted us. Through our jobs and our families, through our relationships, our service to neighbor. And yes, for some of us, that means ministry of word and sacrament in the church. And for others, it may mean milking cows or baking bread or raising children and grandchildren or making toasters and selling them on Amazon, for that matter. <laughs> Point is, we all praise God and honor one another when we follow Jesus' lead and live out our vocations. Today, dearest Karen, today your vocation changes. Just a little. Because God has seen your faithful discipleship over your entire life and has now called you to a new vocation, a new ministry, I dare say a new adventure with the good people of Mount Hebron Lutheran Church in Hildebrand. An adventure that has you lead God's people in living out their vocations as you care and pray for them, love and treasure them, feed them, cry and laugh with them, baptize them, bury them. As has always been the case, Karen, Jesus goes ahead of you in this new journey. The time is fulfilled, Jesus says to you today, and the kingdom of God has come near. Follow me, Jesus says. Karen, follow me. And so you do. And may God bless you for it. Amen. Amen.